Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Actually, about two months ago when I was asked to discuss this paper, I was thinking about, well, it's a great paper, a nice paper to discuss when I'll have a nice time skiing. Since then, I broke my toe, and so it's been very agonizing to sit here today and <laughs> watch you guys having fun. Uh, but uh, that's life, I guess. So uh, to those of you who joined uh, this profession in the last, I would say, five years, let me give you a kind of, a, it's a paper about the tick size. Let me give you some uh, history of what the tick size, uh, as, as Mao explained, it's, it's the minimum price variation. So it's, it's, it essentially determines the profits of market makers, right? So the, the beta spread cannot be smaller than the tick size, right? So, and and the, the beta spread is supposed to compensate uh, market makers, dealers, whoever, uh, to, for uh, those who submit, who, who make liquidity uh, uh, for, the, for, for what they do. So, and it cannot be smaller than the, than the tick size. So until the year 2000, the tick size was actually pretty large. It was like one eighth or one sixteenth. And, and so they had large profits. And in fact, in 1994, there was this controversial paper by uh, Christian Schulz about the, the, the fact that the dealers in uh, Nasdaq did not quote odd A. So made, instead of one eighth tick size, it became effectively a, a one quarter tick size. So it was like, it was a big, the tick size was big and it was a big deal at that time. Uh, and, but since then, it became a small deal, right? Because uh, there was dissimilization and so it's like, it's tiny, it's just one penny, who cares, right? And, uh, and then, so I thought it's kind of, a, this, this literature is kind of dies, but it, it didn't actually. In fact, recently it kind of got its own comeback uh, because of the high frequency trading. So it's, the tick size is small, but there is so much volume, so much trading. So, if you multiply billions of transactions by one small tick size, it's still a lot of money, right? And, and this make take fee, fee uh, structure that Mao is talking about is again related to the tick size, as he explained. And so this is highly, you know, very, uh, this is a debated issue. And so it's again in also in the, in, in the finance academic literature. Now, this fee that the, the make take fee structure, the idea that you charge a different fee on market makers and market takers, those who submit limit more orders or, or market orders, it's, it's a relatively new idea, and it's related to the idea of two-sided markets. Two-sided markets is essentially, there is a literature in economics that deals with this. So what is a two-sided market? Everything is two-sided, right? You need to always need two sides for, to, for a transaction. You need a buyer and a seller. So what's so special about two-sided markets? Well, Roche and Tirol define a two-sided two market as a market in which the volume for, of transactions between the end user, users depends on the structure of the fees, not only on the overall fee. So the breakdown of the fees affects the volume, the amount of transactions, not just the total amount. And credit cards, that, uh, the example that uh, uh, Mao gave, Adobe Acrobat, right? So do you charge those who create the documents? Do you charge those who read the documents? Uh, dating sites charge different fees to men and women uh, for some reason. Uh, and maybe this is maybe, you know, that's another example, financial markets. Is it a two-sided market? Does the breakdown of the fee matter? That's a good question. It's a, it's a controversial issue also. So it's hotly debated. Uh, and the reason is because there is a potential here for a you know, significant wealth transfer between market makers and market takers. Typically, the way it works is that the takers, those who submit market orders, pay a fee, those who submit limit orders get a rebate. And these rebates, as mentioned, are significant. In fact, you can look at it. Mao mentioned the BATS. BATS is a, the third largest stock exchange now in the US. Many people never heard about it. It's just a computer. It's a matchmaker, right? And, and uh, Basically, BATS was founded by the same guy who founded TradeBot. TradeBot is just a high-frequency market maker, one of the largest ones in the U.S. So BATS was the, you know, the, the, the pioneer in make-take-fees make, structure, and TradeBot, TradeBot the, the sister company, collects these make-fees, right? So, so there is some, you know, some uh, concern about these uh, market makers pursuing these rebit capture strategies. Okay. But so these make-take fees have been debated. They've also, there have been a couple of papers, a few papers, several papers that looked at them uh, theoretically. In particular, the first claim that what, what Mao called the, this uh, 
famous result, in neutrality results, it's due to uh, Angel Harrison Spat, who said that these fees shouldn't matter. Why shouldn't they matter? matter? Because whatever you can do with the fees, you can undo with the prices. Right? So suppose we decide, this, the stock exchange, the platform decides to impose uh, higher fees on the maker, then the spreads will narrow, and I'll do, undo that. Okay? And what, what underlies this, this kind of theorem is that you can renegotiate, right? So if there are these fees, we can be, you as the buyer and the seller, the buyers and sellers can sit down and say, this is my, these are my values, let's renegotiate, let's, and, and, and let's re readjust the price in a way that uh, uh, undo, to undo the fees. Now, in a paper that I wrote with the Thierry Foucault and, and Eugene Candle, we actually look at these fees, and of course, to undo that famous result, we, uh, we say, well, we'll have a positive tick size, right? And, and then we show that these fees actually, in that case, matter a lot. What do they matter? Well, they, they affect uh, the frequency of trading, they affect liquidity, they affect uh, welfare, volume, and so on. And Couliard and Foucault also looked at this from the competitive point of view, competitive competition between exchanges. And since then, there have been a bunch of empirical papers that looked at these fees and, and tried to assess how do they affect liquidity. So it's be become a bit competitive, right? It's kind of crowded, this literature. Like it's, not, it's a relatively small topic, and there are quite a few papers already that talk about it. So it's, what's new in this paper? It turns out that there is actually quite a bit new. So this paper does provide a fresh view on the maker-taker pricing model in the sense that it allows one, basically it looks rather than an exchange, it looks at an exchange operator that is allowed to operate more than one exchange, several exchanges, and it also looks at the competition between several exchange operators. Each one of them is allowed to operate more than one exchange, and then they look at what is the optimal price in, th in this case? What is the optimal make-take fee structure in this case? What is the optimal uh, making and taking uh, uh, strategies in this case? Now, all of this in this paper is attributed to the tick size. So without it, the claim in this paper is that without the tick size, none of that would happen because that, this, this neutrality results would hold. Now, I added the question mark here is because one of the things I want to claim is that I'm not sure about that. Okay, so. I want to argue that this neutrality result actually may fail here. So let's see. So let's look at the model. The model is very simple. The fundamental model is very simple. There are buyers and sellers, and there is asymmetric information. The buyers don't know the value of the sellers. The sellers don't know the value of the buyers. They are private values. And it is assumed that they are uniformly distributed. So the buyer acts first, submits a limit order, then the seller says, Either I take it or I leave it. Okay, I either submit a market order or not. Okay, so the objective function of the buyer, and there are fees imposed on both sides. So the objective function of the market maker, given that the market taker has a clear strategy of just take the, the price if, the, if it is sufficiently high, then the market maker problem is basically this. Just take the value of the buyer minus the price that he pays minus the fee that he's gonna pay, that's the maker, subtract and, and then multiply this by the probability that this order is going to be executed, which also depends on the fee that is imposed on this seller, mar uh, the, the market taker who is a seller. So as long as the value of the seller is lower than the uh, cum fee price, he will take it. So this is the objective function of the buyer. Write down the first order condition for that, you'll get an implicit, so G here is just, I'm sorry, G here is just a cumulative distribution. Write down the first order condition, this is a pretty standard result. You'll get that the optimal price, optimal limit order price, is given implicitly, implicitly by this equation, which depends on the make fee and the take fee. Note that the make fee lowers the value to the buyer of obtaining the transaction. The take fee lowers the probability of execution. Here is the first order condition. That's the implicit result for the uh, for the price. What is assumed, so if you look at this, you would see that this is highly nonlinear. So G is just cumulative distribution. Little g is uh, just a density. They can be anything, right? And so it's not clear here why the make the fee and take fee would not affect, the break time would not affect things. In fact, it does in general. And there is, there is a really good reason for that. The, the really good reason for that is that 
uh, is that we cannot sit down and renegotiate the prices. The reason why they way we cannot sit down and renegotiate the prices is because we don't know the private values. Right? If I'll sit down and tell you, you no, know, renegotiate the prices given the fees, I'll just lie to you. Okay, so here the result breaks down. So, but Mao's result is actually correct. How, why is it correct? Because he assumes that the, this G is a uniform distribution. So this, basically this uh, uh, denominator becomes a constant. The cumulative is just linear. And so then suddenly when you assume a uniform distribution, everything kind of is fine. So indeed, in the special case of uniform distribution, you restore this neutrality result. But in general, it actually fails. Uh, good. So given that I have five minutes, I'll skip that. And then I'll talk about two of the main results in the paper. The first main result is regarding a monopolistic exchange operator and how it is going to uh, 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 price, uh, to, 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 given that he is allowed to introduce more than one exchange, how is he going to do that? So what the monopolistic uh, uh, market, sorry, the monopolistic uh, uh, exchange operator is going to do is basically to divide the valuation of the makers into bins. He's going to do the following. He basically is going to create, suppose you want to create two exchanges, and then he's going to basically divide the valuation of the buyers into different levels and associate the lower set of buyers with actually non-execution. They are not going to be executed at all. Associate the medium level of buyers with an exchange with low execution and associate the high value buyers with high execution probability. So essentially what Mao is telling us is that he calls this execution probability the quality of the exchange. And what we have here is essentially second degree price discrimination, the classic results from information economics. Now, this is all true and very nice actually. But why is it true? What is the economics underlying this? The economics, this is something that is, I think is missing in the paper. Why do we have the results that low valuation buyers are associated with no execution and the higher is the valuation, you'll get higher probability of execution. It's not clear from the paper and the answer to that actually comes from our basic micro. It's our old friend, the Spen, the, the, the Spen's merely single processing property. So if you look at the objective function of the, of the buyer, you will see that the marginal benefit from execution is increasing in private value of the buyer. So what does it mean? This is exactly what drives first, uh, second, order, second order price discrimination in micro, right? And it is satisfied here. So what it means is far, first is that local incentive compatibility implies global incentive compatibility. What the paper is actually doing when they prove this result, they just compare just make sure that if the buyer has this value, they don't want to deviate to, this, to here. But they don't show that you actually don't want to deviate from exa for, exa for example to here. But that's fine. You, do, you, know, you don't need to do that because you have single crossing. Single crossing already covered this for you. Two, higher value values will self-select into exchanges with higher execution probability because of this marginal benefit, higher marginal benefit that they ob obtain. Three, the same equilibrium structure applies to any distribution. You don't need to assume the uniform distribution. Any distribution would give you exactly the same structure. Now, it may not be that you'll have to be able to solve it in closed form, but this is a very general result. It's essentially the same result for micro. However, I do have some questions and uh, some concerns. It's not exactly concerned, but I, I don't feel that, again, that the tick size is very much related to that. It's a general result. You don't, it's as much as I can see, you don't need to tick size. You don't need the price discreteness to create this result. All you need is just a finite number of, exa of, of, of uh, exchanges that you are allowed to create. So essentially what's going on here is when you move from low probability of execution to high prob uh, probability of execution, the way you do that is by imposing lower and lower fees on the taker, higher and higher fees on the maker, and totally lower and lower fees. So the fee, the total fee is not kept constant. You are changing both the total fee and the breakdown of the fee. So you don't need this irrelevant result, even if you have it. You are changing everything. 
I'm sorry. So once again, it is not clear to me that this ha has anything to do with the tick size, and I would advise you to, to look at this. The last set of results in the paper is to look at two competing, or at, le at least two competing uh, exchange operators. How does, that, uh, how does competition look like? Here I think uh, they have a very nice result. And the result is that there is no pure strategy equilibrium, which is very much in contrast to the standard Bertrand competition. And the reason that for that is, is a very nice reason. In Bertrand competition, you have the price, right? So basically, you, the, if you have two competitors competing in price, they will each one, as long as the profit is positive, you'll lower the price a little bit until you get to zero profit. And that would be the equilibrium. Here it's different. Here, even if you are at this zero profit, you have these two levers to, to, that you can use. And what can you do? For example, you can increase the make fee, decrease the take fee, and by doing that, you are lowering the profit probability upon execution, but increasing the probability of execution sufficiently create, to create a deviation. And so no, no, there is no pure strategy equilibrium, even with zero profit. It does exist a mixed strategy equilibrium with positive profit. About this equilibrium. So I was trying to think to myself, how does, yeah, how does a mixed strategy equilibrium look like? Basically, the, ex the exchange is supposed to mix on the pricing, right? So do exchanges really mix pricing uh, or randomize the pricing? So the, paper, the way the paper thinks about it is that the exchanges change the pricing over time frequently. So I think, I, I mean, I'm trying to kind of uh, get around how, how to think about the mixed strategy here. What exactly does it say? I think an example would help me. So in particular, what the paper establishes is that an equilibrium, a mixed strategy of equilibrium exists. Okay, but then it stopped there. You know, how does it look like? What does it do? Any comparative statics? None of that. So I, I think I would really, and I think I know why they don't have that, because it's really complicated. So what I would advise you is three other very simplifying assumptions, try to get a very simple example that will give us some intuition on how this equilibrium look like, looks like. Uh, some comparative statics, something that will tell us, you know, what is this equilibrium in which the exchanges choose their uh, 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 pricing policies randomly. And once again, I don't see any relation to that to the, to, to, of, of this result to the tick set. I think this result would hold, all of these results, as far as I can see, would hold even without the policy tick sets. So I'm out of town, time. Uh, I would just say that the paper fo focuses on the paper focuses on policy implications. I would like to see more of some empirical predictions and some positive implications. I think it would be nice. I think I, I have some ideas for you. Maybe I'll discuss them with you uh, later. So let me summarize. I think it's a very interesting paper. It does offer new insights on make and take uh, pricing and the relation to the tick size, although I'm not that sure that everything here in this paper is related to the tick size. In fact, I think it's more general. I think you don't need some of the assumptions that you are making on distributions on a tick size. Uh, and that's it.